tried virtual reality before. If you have, just put your hand up. Yeah? I can see a few hands up in the air. Now, how many people here had tried virtual reality before 2013? If you have, put your hand up. Before 2013? Okay. So now I can see just one hand up. And that's pretty much the norm wherever you go in the world, that before about 2013, virtual reality was really almost the stuff of science fiction. Right now, it seems like it's a new technology. It's emerging, certainly in the consumer space, and has been over the last four to five years. But did you know that this technology is actually over 50 years old? Now, back then, an experience that you can have today with, say, a mobile phone or a system like the Oculus Rift would have required a room full of equipment and millions and millions of dollars. And you'd have had to work in an organization that was very much future-focused, like NASA or the United States Air Force. Thankfully, because of advances in technology, particularly mobile technology, these experiences are now available to people like you and me, and will become much more so as we go on. Next, please. OK, so in 2016, there was a lot of hype, if you will, about virtual reality. It was described as the year of VR. Between 2014 and 2016, the estimate is that over a billion dollars was invested into these technologies in North America and Europe. Everybody was looking for what would the next killer use case be. What they meant was, what is it that we will create with VR that will allow it to exist in the hands of just about everybody everywhere in the world? And they're still asking that question. Some organizations predicted the VR industry will be worth $150 billion by 2020. Right? Two more years to go, let's see. And then people started to wonder, is it all hype? Is VR going into a decline? What's happening? Well, one thing that everybody could agree on, whether they were the ones saying, this is a technology that is going to result in a multi-billion dollar industry, or whether they were saying, this is a technology that we're not really sure about, in terms of how fast it's going to progress, one thing they could agree on was that virtual reality and its complementary tech, augmented reality, will become the computing platform of the future. And when you think about it that way, you begin to realize how critical it is for us to play a part when it comes to these technologies. But is it all good? Next slide. Next slide, please. Now, people have started to explore what the concerns are with these technologies. With VR, as you can imagine, with a headset that's so close to your face and a screen so close to your eyes, there are concerns about vision. What will happen when you spend a significant amount of time with that screen so close to your eyes in an environment that is so engaging and so interactive that sometimes you don't want to leave. Currently, VR experiences are on average about 20 minutes. But what happens when they become much longer? How will the tech evolve so that the eye strain is not so significant? Another concern with the technology is that it causes motion sickness. Now, this has been known to happen if the experience you're having with VR, for example, somebody walking, is not commensurate with the physical experience that you're having. So, if you're in a VR experience where you're supposed to be moving around and, you know, the view mimics the sensation of walking, but you're sitting still, that will then cause dissonance for you physically and can result in nausea. There have been accidents with virtual reality. The environment is so immersive, can be so realistic that people literally forget where they are. And that means they block out the world around them. For example, a gentleman was playing snooker in virtual reality, forgot the table wasn't real, and fell over. And that's just the start. Unfortunately, people have tripped over, 
And as you can imagine, those accidents can get quite nasty if you don't take care. As with a lot of technology today, as we see with social media, for example, there are issues with bullying and harassment. In an environment that you can create that is so realistic, think about what you can do and the experiences that you can create that can be offensive, that can hurt people. And right now, there is not a lot in terms of regulation for what will be created and put out there. Of course, some platforms will say, before we will publish your content, you have to meet certain guidelines. But then there are all sorts of ways in which content can be created and distributed. So we do have to take care. But for me, the greatest peril when it comes to virtual reality is if we, and by we, I mean you and me, are not part of the voices that are determining what this technology will be. Because if VR is created without us, then will it ever really truly work for us? Next slide. I want to tell you a little bit about what's happening with VR in Nigeria. Next slide. Around the world, we've seen a lot of use cases gaining a lot of traction. For example, VR and medicine, healthcare. And the same is being done here in Nigeria. The lady behind me is a woman called Tox Bakare, and she works with autistic children. Now, as you might know, mental health care can be severely under-resourced. But with virtual reality, she's able to create therapeutic interventions that she can administer at scale. She's also able to create experiences that allow people to understand better how to interact with a child that has autism, and also even to understand what it feels like to be a child with autism in a public space. Next slide. Another area in which VR is gaining a lot of traction is architecture. Around the world, it's being used for visualizations, especially with high-end real estate. If you wanted to buy a house or build a house, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could walk through it before it actually existed? So you could be sure about the placement of columns, about the amount of space you wanted in your kitchen. With VR, this is possible. And the app that you see behind me is one created by Cleese Designs, a company in Lagos, that allows you to do just that, walk through the visualization of the design for a house to be built. Next slide. Art is another area in which VR is also being used significantly. Now you know we have a rich tradition of amazing art that reflects our culture and heritage. What would it be like if we could get our artists to then expand the scope of content that they can work, that they can create with a tool like virtual reality, so that you not only get to view the arts as a separate entity, but you can also inhabit the art if you wanted to. And finally, next slide, VR for education. Now you might be thinking, how exactly does VR play in this space? Isn't VR expensive? Isn't it, isn't it something that is predominantly used by gamers? But I want to ask you a few questions to explore this further. Next slide. Does anybody know what these numbers represent? Anybody? The first number, 263 million, in 2014, represented the number of children who were out of school around the world. The second number, 10.5 million, represents the number who are out of school in Nigeria. And remember, this is from 2014, so slightly outdated. But at that time, that was the highest number for any one country in the world. And that final number, 1 billion, that's a conservative estimate for the number of children who do not have access to good quality education. Now, if you think about that Mandela quote that we saw on the previous slide, 
that education is the most powerful weapon that we can use to change the world, then you see we have a problem. And I think VR can help. Next slide. VR for schools is a solution that I think can be applied everywhere. And I'll tell you how. On the screen, you'll see a low-cost VR headset, the Google Cardboard. It's open source. The specs are online. You can build your own if you want. And it's literally just cardboard and some lenses. And then you need a mobile phone, one that's VR capable with mobile broadband. And then, if you're in an area with power challenges, a solar portable that can keep that mobile phone charged. Now, if you have that and the right content, you have an all-in-one learning device that you can deploy anywhere. You can take it into schools, into local schools here. For those 10.5 million children who are out of school, you can literally take school to them. Think about it. Next slide. But that is just scratching the surface of what might be possible with virtual reality. To realize it, though, there are a number of things that we have to do. I believe the first is to be inclusive. Now, by inclusive, I'm saying make sure that everybody has access to this technology, everybody who wants to. That means, regardless of gender, where you come from, how much money you have, where you went to school, if you want to, you can try out VR or you can create for VR. And I want to show you a little video, short video of a space in Lagos that is allowing this to be possible. Video, please. creation lab that allows people to engage with the technology, and I believe we need several more of these. The second thing that we need to do is to collaborate, to work together. Luckily for us around Nigeria, people are beginning to experiment with this technology. If we come together as a community, we're able to do so much more. But this needs to go beyond the borders of Nigeria and across the African continent. Next slide. Which is why I'm very thrilled that this event, where seven countries on the African continent are going to come together to have activities, a hackathon around AR and VR, is critical and must be encouraged. And then, the final thing that I say we must do is to get involved and get involved today. Next slide. Because I believe these words of Dan Gote from his interview last year, that the only way to move Africa forward is for people like you, like me, to make very bold moves to determine our future. So I ask you, next slide, the future is yours to create, what will you do? Thank you.